this is on uh, uh, part of uh, the future of uh, business education and the theme for this session is uh, uh, industry academia uh, linkages right and we have with us very learned uh, panel members uh, we have a limited time we are running late by almost an hour and the time given to us was about 45 minutes and i don't know whether we would should be able to take 45 minutes because i am also running out of time uh, and because of the limited time, I think the best way would be that uh, all of us speak for two, three minutes, just introductory thing. And then if you have time, then we uh, maybe I can figure out some question and ask you a question and we'll do it. Now, industry uh, academia interaction is in a B school domain is really very crucial. Uh, you know, when we were students earlier on, the uh, recruiters would typically recruit students and put them through a training program for a year or so. Uh, today, that's not the scenario. They want, um, you know, job-ready students. And uh, so therefore, we need to uh, take up uh, matters in a way that when students get recruited, they are on the job, uh, you know, straight away after uh, they get placed. So therefore, students have to be up to speed in terms of what is it that is expected of them. And uh, so the B schools have to uh, fine-tune their own curriculum and interactions uh, with the industry. Uh, uh, why interaction with industry? Because we know, um, I was in a conference yesterday somewhere and they put the word education 5.0. As somebody, we have heard about 2.0, 3.0, 4.0. Now, what is this 5.0? With a chat GPT has come. So, chat GPT has come, things are going to uh, go topsy turvy, things are going to change drastically. So, now we need to be talking about uh, education 5.0. Now, in academics, the curriculums remain the same. There's no changes. You know, it'll take time for changes to happen. So the students have to be made ready to take on the industry. Uh, you need to bring in these kinds of elements into the curriculum in their learning experience. How do we do that? So the industry people have to come in. So there are certain standard formats that the uh, B schools follow. Uh, one is the uh, regulator uh, driven thing, like the internship they have for about uh, uh, three months. That's one way. Then the corporate members uh, or corporate executives are invited to deliver uh, talks and uh, talk to students, uh, get invited as a panel members and, uh, you know, be judges to some student event. And that's about it. But that's not enough. So at least at four school of management, we have not taken that as enough. And we are working feverishly into enhancing the student interaction. The various models we have tried we have had failures in many. We have had mixed uh, success in many. So we're still experimenting with something. And we have started a new program on uh, uh, the industry interaction uh, to upgrade our students. So if we have time, we can talk about it. We don't have time. So with this uh, preliminary initial thought about the, the, the industry uh, uh, academia interaction, particularly in the B school, which is very crucial, let's have a, a quick uh, three to three minutes or four minutes of views. Uh, and then uh, we will see if we can get into some kind of a discussion. So I will start from left and go on the right hand side. I'll not interrupt midway. So if uh, if you exceed four minutes, then I'll tap on the phone, right? So that we are able to maintain time. And then let's see how it goes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, for us at uh, Lexicon, um, one of the key aspects is that uh, the B school operates like a corporate hub itself in terms of uh, both structure, in terms of how the org flow is and how the engagement and interaction is from a perspective of a student, a faculty and all um, the young leaders that sit out there. At Starts, uh, our curriculum, the way that we built it in, they actually have a nine month uh, research and learning internship that is there. So where they work on live projects and on simulations whilst they're doing their internships and they have to kind of end it with a complete uh, capstone project that goes out there. Um, we've also done through our center of excellence, we've got a lot of tie ups in place where during the last trimester of uh, the student journey, um, they are learning the curriculum in base of the company that they're getting recruited to. So we obviously have uh, tie-ups in place with various corporates who are kind of picking up these students and placing them. So with these students, they actually, they have faculty coming in from their company, spending time training the students in the form of certification. So when they are going on 
into their placement journey or starting their job, there is an element of day zero readiness that sits out there. And a lot of the heavy lifting, be it from a culture perspective, be it from a learning perspective, has already been done out there. Um, there was a lot of engagement that we tried to do through industry mentors. So um, each of our students uh, has an industry mentor so that we've uh, got a collab in place where uh, we've got industry leaders taking on 10 to 15 students based on the availability of time that they can commit to uh, in investing in these students, uh, where uh, they, uh, they kind of commit to giving them approximately four hours a quarter where they are spending time with them, training them. The students can reach out to them uh, and be there. Uh, the other element that we've worked a lot on is networking skills, because as you kind of grow up into the corporate world, one of the most element, most important elements is networking. I've always believed that it's the heartbeat of any uh, uh, professional out there. So from various events, including um, a golf tournament, where we've got close to 100 CEOs that we kind of uh, invite into Pune and do an annual golf tournament out there where each um, uh, CEO has uh, ambassadors that are linked with them so they can have a learning opportunity out there. That's kind of happens. The key obviously being that as much connect a student can get with current young leaders and experienced leaders, that's how, how they will kind of grow and kind of prosper out there. They'll uh, spend time out there building that. And obviously, uh, from a digital perspective, ensuring that their profiles and their networking abilities on LinkedIn are enhanced. So yeah, that's initial. I, I think I'm in, in my cut of four minutes out there, so we can take on more questions later. Thank you. Absolutely on time. Uh, just one caveat here. You know, while we're talking of industry uh, academia interaction, uh, by and large, uh, we end up focusing on the students' involvement in these uh, activities. Uh, but there's other aspect to this, which is the faculty internship. So the faculty getting uh, interned in the industry, so they are up to speed in the current practices in the industry so that they can deliver better in the classroom. That's also an important aspect. So if you have any such experience in dealing with these kinds of things, uh, kindly do share or if you have any quick views on that, because we are also exploring that option at, at, at four school. Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So we've got to own a classroom uh, concept uh, that is there with the uh, corporates, uh, where um, the faculty uh, actually goes in for uh, time presence in the company to understand what is current out there. And they're collaborating with the leaders out there in terms of what the outflow is in terms of uh, the student interaction. Um, also with the faculty, what we've done is a program on reverse mentoring. So they're spending a lot of time with uh, uh, not only students themselves and understanding what's the need out there, but also a lot of young leaders to understand what's happening because a lot of times relevance to what is current is critical. And the whole reverse mentoring process has been uh, very instrumental in driving that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and uh, good evening, everyone. We can find students sitting at the back and this is going to definitely help them too. Uh, <clears throat> uh, what I feel is, see, all of us are privileged to be here occupying a seat and uh, probably we're getting good students and they're getting placed too. Uh, for, for me, all the students who pass out of every B school is my catchment area. In which case, I feel that syllabus, everything is okay in many of the colleges are uh, autonomous and so all, many of them, them are uh, driven by the universities. There is far more that we can do. At SEMS Coaching School of Business, what we do is we get students from more from South India. And so we have a profiling. And uh, along with the profiling, what we do is we conduct a series of psychometric tests. Each student is attached to a mentor too. Just like he said, we have a reverse mentoring from the industry and the alumni. We try to identify the gap. It's a very simple process. So a, a faculty who is a mentor, in fact, gets eight to 10 students as mentees. It's very easy. So these are all you know, uh, 
uh, it's very easy to track my mentee. And when I find as a mentor that there's a gap for a particular person, what I do without informing the mentee, we have the faculty team, the group who sits together once every fortnight for uh, these students whom we need to upgrade. So which are the skills? All of us heard, have been hearing from morning about upskilling, reskilling, and so on. I'm not going further in it. But there are certain areas that can be fixed easily. And that, those are identified. And that is connected to a dossier. All these are, there are so many edu tech companies here. We have our own system. So these are connected to the dossier. So since a student can easily gauge where he or she is on the base of a SWOC, they, uh, on a trimester system, they evaluate themselves. So if I have written, uh, if I have in the beginning of the course, if I felt that my um, uh, sp uh, you know, uh, confidence is just eight or eight on a 10 point scale, just uh, three or four, I can slowly monitor myself. Simultaneously, the mentor is also monitoring. At the end of the course, we give a certificate as uh, what he was, oh, sorry, I should not be using what he, so as what the student was to what the student is. Thereby, we have felt that we could reduce the gap to a great extent, to a great extent. Again, regarding the upskilling, since we have an industry every week, on campus, we, which we call Triple-I, that is Industry Institute Interaction. We get comments from the industry and the recruitment uh, and the companies. And we have a graph. When, an, when my mentee walks into the campus, I mean, soon all our colleges are, going, uh, are on admission now. When my mentee joins, I try as a mentor and a panel, I cannot, as a mentor, I cannot single-handedly decide that he or she has uh, uh, communication skill excellent, uh, uh, you know, computational skill excellent, or uh, confidence skill excellent, team building skill excellent, no. They go, for the first three months, or what we call the trimester, they go through series of exercises. So I feel that has done a great deal to reducing the gap. Thank you. Yeah, you are dot on time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Chairman and uh, other panel members and uh, all uh, delegates and students. Uh, the topic which uh, Mr. Ravi on the contact is said that uh, bridging the industry academia gap. That was the topic actually given. In fact, uh, gap has actually been uh, reduced, but we have not come together fully. See, the industry is also looking for opportunities of paying back to the alma mater or even academic institutions for that matter. And uh, some of the academic institutes are saying that uh, industry is not supporting, but whereas they are supporting in a big way. So what is the best way of utilizing or how to ensure that this uh, gap can be reduced? Uh, we have to involve the industry people in the entire academic cycle of the institute. The academic cycle starts with admission process and then we have orientation and then we have classes being conducted and then we have uh, uh, projects and as well as examinations. So when you involve in all these things, automatically they will come for placements because you have already developed rapport with uh, the people. And uh, at our Institute of Public Enterprise, uh, we have been involving in all these uh, stages of academic cycle, right? From admissions, orientation program, uh, and then afterwards classes. Some of the industry people are uh, requested to teach full course or at least guest lectures. And the students have so many clubs at the Institute, almost 14 to 15 student clubs. For every domain area, there is a club, marketing, finance, HR, operations, business, business analytics, book reading club, cultural club, photography club. Now the students, they uh, take the help of the faculty, they invite industry people. They get to know about the industry people. And then students organize one major management event called as Samskriti, where uh, all B schools from the entire country, they are invited, including IIMs, IITs. The students organize the event. They are also industry people are invited as uh, judges for the event. The students conduct another event called a startup PDF, so where uh, they invite uh, all entrepreneurs and including alumni and uh, the competition where again students from all BA schools they participate and where they come up to the B plan and uh, they make presentation. So industry people are invited as mentors, they guide in the uh, proposal preparation and finally they declare the winner. 
like their students organize events like samati for every domain area there is samati samati in sanskrit means meeting of the finest minds samati so finance samati marketing samati hr samati so this samati is an event where we utilize the opportunity to bring the best practices what are happening whatever you have taught but over and above that uh, we uh, provide an opportunity for practitioner to share their experiences so that the uh, students get the opportunity then another opportunity is two months internship when the student work there so there is one guide in the industry there is also a guide in the institution and what we uh, tell the faculty please maintain the rapport with the industry guide mentor invite him for a lecture because every faculty is teaching a three grade course 30 hours invite industry people or your own mentor whom you know for one or two sessions so like that rapport has to be developed and the industry people also feel that yes we are working closely with an academic institution and they are always ready to help so this way uh, they act as uh, uh, guides or mentors and a long term relationship is established over the process automatically there is an opportunity of placement they think about the institution uh, with which they are associated right from the stage 1 of the academic cycle uh, this is how we actually we can reduce the industry academic uh, gap thank you thank you so much our time has been just dropped by 10 minutes so it's so not 40 minutes i think we have only 30 minutes now so so over to professor das see this industry academia gap uh, can exist across multiple dimensions so at imi what we decided to do was focus on one dimension to start off with and we wanted to choose that dimension which would give us the biggest bang for the buck in terms of bridging that gap so the dimension that we chose to focus on was the gap between what industry expects from mba graduates and what the mba graduates actually are and and there is a gap you know and i'm not talking about soft skills gap i'm talking about domain knowledge gap uh, industry expects certain domain knowledge certain capabilities and students graduating out of a b school may not always have those capabilities so what did we do to bridge that gap we we brought in industry uh, recruiters the business people on the recruitment companies to come and help us design curriculum so we we went to the root root problem the curriculum so we said okay let's accept the fact that maybe our curriculum is not aligned with what industry wants today it might have been aligned with what industry wanted earlier but not today so we got uh, industry folks people who would be managing our students when they went go to work there on that across the table to tell us what learning outcomes do they want so it is not enough to, for them to say they must know this topic they must know that topic the topics are not what they do on the job they are they are expected to do certain things what are the learning outcomes they want and from the learning outcomes in consultation with these industry folks we reverse engineered the curriculum and that has been a major exercise over the last few years for our multiple programs one one or two programs every year where we have done a major curriculum restructuring exercise with inputs from industry starting off with the learning outcomes they desire and then reverse engineering the curriculum from those learning outcomes and you know we had always been getting in about 20% of uh, lectures to be delivered by industry folks so a given class a given course of say 30 hours you know as per practice 6 hours would be outsourced to some industry practitioner but they would have come earlier and taught what was in our curriculum and that curriculum might have been suboptimal in terms of meeting the expectations of the recruiter so now they are involved in the curriculum design so they already have ownership and skin in the game and then they come in and deliver 20% of that curriculum so things are much more aligned so this is something that we have seen has helped us a lot we developed an analytics concentration just about 4 years ago and that we did from the very beginning in this manner and uh, we have been able to you know get very good recruitment outcomes in that space because there was alignment from day one so this is what we have been doing to to bridge the industry uh, academia gap in that one dimension of the gap between what the recruiter wants and what the students bring to the table when they graduate uh, that's uh, wonderful um uh if you look at the way uh, the the industry academic gap has been addressed by a lot of institutions uh you know we a lot of institutes would, would want to break it up into two parts which is one is the uh, what we call the hygiene factor 
so the curriculum uh, upgradation is a routine process you do it end of every term for the next term you bring in the uh, industry to uh, uh, corporate executives uh, uh, to share the curriculum with design with them uh, even share the pedagogy with them and they give you input so you fine tune the curriculum and then it is the professors who teach the courses and then you bring in these industry speakers to do it one of the biggest gap as uh, professor das also mentioned is the gap in the learning outcome so uh, while the industry has an expectation but the professors are the one who are the delivery agents so how do you actually fulfill that gap so we realize that it's not only the professors who have to do it uh, but then if the professors are the corporate then you don't have that kind of an issue but that's not possible because you know the requirements for having a professor is different and the requirement for having a corporate is different so therefore this question came of uh, faculty doing internship okay. that's not easy we explored that option but faculty has an issue corporate has an issue that's not really feasible so then how do you engage the corporate such that the learning gap is uh, addressed in a way now this is where a lot of uh, mentorship comes in you know the life projects come in and there are softwares available the, the hr professionals some of the companies they offer you these the software on which you sign up the students sign up and they have a pool of uh, corporate executives who sign up and they choose the uh, students or the student choose the uh, the corporates and there's some kind of interaction we tried that and it really doesn't work it, it has not worked because corporates they never find time to engage with the students and of course they expect some kind of incentive and so how much incentive we gave and you know, why should they spare time and you know, all those issues are there so this has been a teething problem and we are all looking at enhancing students learning such that the placement happens um, the way it is uh, uh, expected so we are also experimenting on this aspect as to how do we find you so we say continuous uh, uh upgradation learning from the issues coming up and then fine tuning our engagement with the corporate and doing uh, essentially mentorship in a different avatars every time so we have started a new uh, a kind of a mentorship just now uh and that too as a pilot project with about you know short num less number of people and if it works out well then we'll do it so hopefully this entirely different uh, style of doing it Uh, let's see it should work out i don't want to share because we are not very sure so so the my question here to the panel is that you have done these uh, industry academia gap addressing in different ways you know uh, briefly i have stated some of them so have you experienced a, a problem which you on a hindsight you said that had i done that in a different way i would have done better if the such such experiences maybe the audience would uh, be able to find some common chord with uh, that and it just might help so it's open to anyone i hope i am clear on that yeah yeah, yeah. So, uh, so one point which i forgot to inform earlier the academic cycle of admissions there is a curriculum uh, design stage there we involve them in the board of study academic advisory council so so there we involve in the academic advisory and as well as curriculum board of study so that they help us in giving the inputs relating to the changes in syllabus whatever we can do uh, we can we, so we incorporate these sessions and uh, do that so uh, even coming to the process of inviting all the mentors to the campus so we are not able to fully implement but though we have uh, have it a policy individual teacher also should uh, uh, take the initiative go and meet them in their office that is very important take an appointment meet them and develop the rapport Uh, which will help in getting some training programs and in the long term so we, we have to work in this direction actually in fact now i was thinking uh, uh when uh, companies uh, came to campus they were talking about uh, analytics uh, must be four years three years four years uh, back itself so um we were even out there was all of us are teaching excel right ms excel is being taught at the premier at the uh, as part of foundation uh we changed the nomenclature instead of putting as ms excel we put it as business intelligence uh, as a subject you won't believe people started attending it with full i mean attendance is there but they were all, all the more excited to prove that i am intelligent so that work that clicked well so term 1 that was fine so we had to take it to business intelligence course 1 2 3 and later on of course it comes to uh, uh, uh what is it uh, business analytics and so on but a small ch a change in nomenclature did add um uh, i would say 
and also motivated students to do better, which we felt. So, yeah, in uh, in just terms of learnings, you know, um, one of the things that I'd learned very early was uh, what gets measured gets done, you know, and uh, initially uh, in our assessment processes, we had a lot of emphasis on the trimester end exam where nearly close to 70% actually sat there and 30% on continuous uh, assessments, um, just let's say around four years or back. Um, learning and as we evolve, we've now got that down to 50-50. And that's drastically changed the outcome uh, in terms of learnings for a student. So that's something that we observed. We made the change and we've seen a huge benefit to that. Any, any other? Uh, Professor Das, I'll specifically address your question that is there something in hindsight we think we could have done differently or better in whatever we are doing to bridge the industry uh, academia gap. Now, see, what often happens is that, and this is something that is human nature, there is a lot of resistance to change uh, among all faculty, senior, junior, whatever. So they are used to teaching a certain course with a certain content. And they believe, you know, that is relevant, even though industry uh, consumers of that uh, uh, talent pool that comes out may not believe it's relevant. And, uh, you know, in these meetings that we have for curriculum restructuring, you know, people are polite. So the industry folks who come are too polite to say that uh, what you're doing is archaic, right? And uh, and so we have been at times gotten this sense earlier on, become complacent that maybe what we're doing is reasonably relevant. Maybe 80% of it is relevant and 20% we have to do differently from what they're telling us. Whereas actually it might be 50-50. I'm just making up numbers here, right? So what, what we have learned is that we need to somehow create an atmosphere in that room where the industry folks seem you know, feel that they can be candid and they can call a spade a spade and they don't have to be extra polite and not say something that, you know, might upset the professors. And But that has required for, for us to do a, some kind of a mindset change internally because the entire team of colleagues who walks into that room has to be able to be on board of that philosophy and tell the industry people there, you tell us point blank without, you know, mincing words. Just say what you have to say, call a spade a spade. So I think that has been our biggest learning, which is a resistance to change, you know, overcoming thing. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a cultural issue of being willing to accept that maybe there is somebody out there who knows what is relevant for our students to learn today that we may be good at delivering, but we may not have known that that is relevant for them to learn today. So that has been our biggest learning. Uh, that uh, reminds me of an anecdotal story from, uh, I am Lucknow, I was a professor there, uh, which we try to, you want to go? Uh, which we try, because we still have five minutes, yeah. Uh, which we tried, uh, you know, doing at, at Ford School of Management. Um, the recruiters, when they come for recruitment, uh, the feedback is taken from them post the interview process. As to you know what, you think is the gap in the student, and we do it at four school as well, and we take a you know summarize that and then you know do a process. At Lucknow, I am Lucknow. This the similar thing was done, and the, the placement office and the, the, the concerned dean in charge collated all that information and pa passed on that information to the respective areas, you know, academic areas. Then you need to look at that and you know fine tune it. There was one gap which was uh, not being addressed by the concerned area, you know, the HR area. So he tried his best to tell the area chair that, well, this is something which the corporate says that you need to put it into the curriculum and it's not being done by any of the course. So the, the area says, I'll share it in my group and then, you know, I'll find out. And nothing was done. So this matter was brought to the academic council meeting. You know, the entire faculty is sitting there, the faculty council meeting. And that's how I came to know. So this matter was brought in and it was shared that, well, this is the gap. 
So the director was requested that, well, there's the gap now, please, you know, tell people. So he said, okay, which area does this fall into? You know, he, the, the detailing was given. So they, somebody said, oh, this falls into the HR area. So, okay, HR area. So, okay, so which course it falls into? Uh, somebody said, oh, okay, the closest is this particular course. Okay. So he says, okay, this particular course. So who teaches that course? The professor was sitting there. Okay. So this professor teaches that course. So this is the closest can get into. So he was requested that, oh, please include this in your curriculum and change the curriculum design for next uh, term onwards. So he justified that, no, I don't need to do that because this is an elective course and I've put in a lot of effort to design it and I don't want any changes to happen. He refused. So he, it was insisted and insisted, refused, and then insisted again. The file he gave up. And he said, okay, okay, I'll, I'll ch bring that change in my curriculum. Now, coincidentally, he was sitting next to me. So the, the subject matter moved to the next agenda and discussion continued. After three, four minutes, he leans towards me and tells me in Hindi, uh, Professor Das, I'll teach only what I know. <laughs> you force me to... So, so, so Professor Himadri Das point, you know, the faculty is resistant to any new thing that, that, that gets in. So what we have tried to do at Ford School of Management, for example, these are the standard operating procedure. When the recruiter comes for recruitment, so we take a feedback. And this is uh, a lot of art required. You cannot go and ask, uh, tell me something. So you get into a conversation, you talk to them. So the people who are involved in this, they end of the uh, meeting, they write a report, you know, four line, five line, that's it, two line, one line. They have to write a report and just keep filing it. And that's how we capture all those uh, uh, details. So once that is summarized, instead of uh, uh, the uh, any group of specific group of people giving that feedback to the uh, area chair, we decided because of this experience of mine at Amlux now that don't give it to the area chair. You yourself figure out who is the professor who is closest to this, and have a one-to-one -one chat and request that way. This is what the corporates require. I think you are doing a great job in your course. So can you include this in the curriculum next time onwards? And we found that the, the reception was actually 100%. Everybody said, oh, yeah, that's okay. Oh, I didn't know. And I thought it's not important. Okay, then I'll fine tune it and do it. The resistance comes when the area chairs tell them, oh, who are you to tell me this? You know, I don't report to you. And then once the negativity sets in, then be it a faculty council meeting or even the chairman of the board who tells you to do it and professors can't be budged to them and I won't do it. So if you, you know, on a hindsight, you know, if you do it uh, like this, you you get them involved in uh, you know that uh, gap which is there. Uh, they they own up. They, oh, okay, I understand. Okay, that's fine. And this is not a professor telling; it's the placement officer who tells. He, sir, we have done our this, and I think, sir, you, you are the one who looks into the, the the placement in charge has taken a feedback and talked to other professors to know who is the guy, right? And then he goes, so there's a much better uh, you know, reception of these, uh, inclusive in terms of they accepting these kinds of things. So uh, that's my view. Any other perspective that you would like to give quickly? We still have a minute. So uh, I think that's about it. Uh, thank you very much. I think we